Information you share about your family's DNA might be helping authorities catch suspects wanted for violent crimes. CC Moore, head of the Genetic Genealogy Unit at Parabon Nano Labs, her unit cracked the cold case. DNA advancements have tightened the ropes on criminals. Genetic genealogist C.C. Moore is one of the main people who can be thanked for that. Moore's hobby of tracking family tree roots has paved the way for new crime-solving methods. Criminals who would have otherwise gone undetected have now been charged. Using the same genetic technique as the one used in the case of the Golden State Killer, Moore has helped close many cold cases and has brought closure to many families. Hi, my name is Matt, and welcome back to Mysterious 7. Today, we look at five cold cases solved by DNA detective C.C. Moore in 2022. Without any further ado, let's dive right in. The case of a 14-year-old girl from Fairfax County who was sexually assaulted in 1987 went cold. Her attacker remained anonymous for 35 years. Until finally, DNA taken from the crime identified him as 59-year-old William Clark of Ashburn. At the time, Clark was 24 and was posing as a well-known radio DJ, Don Geronimo. He called the victim's mother at work and used the ruse of a prize giveaway, convincing her to divulge personal information. Clark told the mother that she was eligible for a $1,000 cash prize and a trip to Hawaii. The catch? She had to present herself at the radio station. After sharing her contact information and home number, Clark made his move. On March 6, 1987, Clark called the victim's home. He claimed that she was to meet him at the radio station. The girl was told to get into his car with the promise of prizes. Clark then drove the victim to a wooded area. Once there, he proceeded to sexually assault her, implying he had a gun to keep her silent. He then drove off. After the assault, the victim immediately reported the incident to police. DNA was taken and preserved for 35 years. In the span of three and a half decades, Clark went on to live a full life. He married, had a family, and enjoyed a career. Genealogical testing abruptly ended his freedom. DNA from the crime was entered into the national database. Moore was able to reconstruct Clark's family tree through distant relatives and public records. Through testing on both maternal and paternal sides, Clark was the only person who fit the profile in the end. Police Chief Kevin Davis said genetic genealogical testing was a testament to modern technology allowing for cases like this to be solved. Clark was arrested on his way to work and formally charged with abduction and intent to defile in the 1987 assault case. The arrest closed the case that police initially linked to 70 other suspects. Police issued a statement to all possible victims of Clark to come forward with more information. On July 2, 1996, staff at the Prince Marat Motel made a gruesome discovery. The body of 44-year-old James Edwin Branner was found in the bathtub of a motel room. Autopsy results later revealed that Branner died of asphyxiation. Evidence found at the scene included a wash towel stuffed in his mouth, blood, and fingerprints. With no new leads, the case went cold. In 2020, Tallahassee Detective Brittany Abel reopened the case. She noticed the abundance of physical evidence. With new technology, she decided to give the investigation another try. At first, there were no leads. She then opted for genealogy testing, which ended up cracking the case. DNA process from the recovered evidence led investigators to Alan Lefferts, the 71-year-old man was arrested 26 years after Branner's death. Lefferts was formally charged with first-degree murder in 2022 by a grand jury. The Tallahassee Police Department alleged that Branner was killed during a physical altercation in the motel room. Both men were believed to have known each other as the room was registered under the names of Jim and Al Branner. 
DNA from the crime scene was used by Parabon Nano Labs and CC Moore to test against possible genealogical matches. Genetic evidence pointed to a member of the Lefferts family, eventually pinpointing Alan Lefferts. Lefferts was arrested near Jacksonville with help from Baker's County Sheriff's deputies. Police later learned that Lefferts was previously convicted. He had served time in prison from 1979 to 1989 for the rape and murder of a 15-year-old girl. Branner's daughter, Holly McNabb, said she was happy to finally get the answers the family needed. It had been too long. She missed having her father to share the majority of her life with. McNabb commended the Tallahassee Police Department on a job well done and their constant support. Lindy Sue Beekler was a 19-year-old newlywed who lived in Pennsylvania in 1975. She was found stabbed to death in her Manor Township apartment on December 5th of that same year. Beekler was found by relatives lying on her back with a knife sticking out of her neck. The knife had been taken from her own kitchen and the handle wrapped with a tea towel. Beekler suffered 19 stab wounds to her neck, chest, back, and abdomen. Signs of struggle were evident. The flower shop worker had just returned home from grocery shopping. She was attacked while unpacking. Her grocery bags were left on the table. Blood was found outside the front door on the entryway and patches of the carpet. A search for suspects yielded no promising results. Decades passed without any arrest for the gruesome crime. In the 1990s, investigators submitted DNA from semen found on Beekler's underwear to CODIS. No matches were made. Despite scores of tips and over 300 interviews with people of interest, no new leads were discovered. Investigators went as far as consulting psychics when traditional methods had failed. In 2020, genetic genealogist C.C. Moore latched on to the case. Using the same methods employed in the arrest of the Golden State Killer, Moore began her work. The case proved difficult, and Moore herself said she was disappointed by the results. The DNA match was traced back to the 1700s or 1600s. Not one to give up, Moore decided to try a different strategy. She studied migration patterns of the immigrants from a town called Gasparina in Italy to Lancaster, Pennsylvania. After months of tireless research, Moore struck gold. She discovered a local club of residents from Italy existed. Each of them had membership cards, and Moore scoured them until she found those immigrants from Gasparina. Looking for Italian immigrants who had lived in Lancaster in 1975, she zeroed in on one name. David Sinopoli. Now, these restrictions further narrowed the scope of the subsequent research because there were very few individuals living in Lancaster at the time of the crime that were the right age, gender, and had a family tree consistent with these origins. Sinopoli was 68 years old at the time of his arrest. He was living in Lancaster since the time of the murder. Sinopoli previously lived in Beekler's apartment complex. Yet his name did not come up throughout the investigation. With a name, investigators needed a sample to match. Prosecutor Heather Adams said the investigators conducted a low-key surveillance on February 11, 2022. Was first on the scene, was met by Lindy Sue's aunt and uncle, who had discovered what can only be described as a horrific scene. Sina Poli, along with his wife and another couple, sat drinking coffee early that morning. They were waiting for an early morning flight at a Philadelphia International Airport. Unknown to the suspect, investigators watched as Sina Poli threw away his coffee cup. Swooping in, detectives retrieved the cup from the trash can. After nearly five decades of dead ends, the DNA sample from the cup matched the DNA found on Beekler's underwear all those years earlier. In April 2022, Sinopoli was arrested without incident. The charge? One count of criminal homicide. The news shocked the community, as former co-workers said they never expected this from him. For over 40 years, Sinopoli worked as a press operator in Lancaster County. 
he lived his entire life in Lancaster. Records show he was married twice, once in 1974 to Deborah Burns, a year before Beekler's murder. The couple lived together in the same apartment complex as the victim, and they had two children before divorcing in 1986. In 1987, he married his current wife, a woman named Marina Surachi. Together, they have one child. Sinopoli had a previous run-in with the law, and he was charged with invasion of privacy and disorderly conduct for spying on a female customer. The woman was naked in a tanning room and a salon allegedly owned by his current wife, Marina. He was sentenced to one year probation after pleading guilty. People that knew Sinopoli had no idea of the previous charge. On Facebook, photos show Sinopoli wearing hunting gear. He told friends that he was enjoying retirement. He also posted that he and his wife were looking to buy a cabin just outside of Lancaster. Following his arrest for the 1975 murder of Beekler, his Facebook page was promptly deleted. For Lindy Beekler, her life ended tragically on the evening of December 5, 1975. What was meant to be an evening of exchanging recipes ended in horror for her family. She was described as extremely compassionate and unbelievably charming by her husband, Phil. She fought fiercely for her life, but it ended too soon. Thanks to Moore and her team, her family's questions were finally answered. Sinopoli's preliminary hearing is scheduled for September 22, 2022. Currently, he is being held at Lancaster County Prison without bail. For 32 years, Jerry Rosado remained a free man. That is until genetic tracing finally matched him to a sexual assault from 1990. Susan Nagersmith from Carmel, New York, was visiting friends over Memorial Day weekend in Wildwood, New Jersey. Her body was discovered partially clothed near a dumpster behind a Wildwood restaurant. An autopsy revealed that Susan had been sexually assaulted. Susan was a 20-year-old girl out celebrating the holiday weekend with friends. She was looking forward to the vacation before returning home in pursuit of a career in fashion marketing. Those dreams were shattered when Wildwood police found her partially clothed body behind a restaurant. A bloody handprint was found on her pink shirt at the time of the investigation. Susan was covered in cuts and scrapes and also had a chipped tooth. Speaking to witnesses, one man who remains unnamed claimed that she had been extremely intoxicated. Despite his efforts to help her back to her hotel, he gave up after several unsuccessful attempts. He ended up leaving her near the location where her body was eventually found. Other witnesses claimed to have heard screaming around the time of her death. That, however, was chalked up as other partygoers having a good time. The autopsy later revealed that Susan was sexually assaulted and had 26 separate points of trauma. Her feet were also noted to be clean. This meant she had not walked to the alleyway in which she was found. In light of all the evidence, Susan's death was ruled an accident, caused by hypothermia, heart failure, and exposure linked to intoxication. Furthermore, the medical examiner ruled her injuries to be caused by tripping and falling, due to her intoxication. This ruling was made despite her being posed with her underwear removed and draped around her ankles and her shirt and bra pushed up exposing her breasts. Shocked by the findings, Susan's family fought hard to have her case reclassified as a homicide. Her father, Kent, pursued the case tirelessly. In an interview in 1993, he claimed that it was assumed she was to blame for her own death. Due to her being intoxicated, Ken further alleged that the authorities in Wildwood wanted to retain the reputation of the resort town. Forced to battle the county medical examiner and state, the decision was eventually reversed. Expert analysis from pathologists provided evidence which proved that Susan had been strangled. Fractures were identified in the cartilage around her larynx. Three years after her brutal death, Susan's case was finally classified as a homicide, and investigations began. 
DNA samples were taken from Susan's body and were then used by the state police major crimes unit in the investigation. However, progress was slow and hindered by lack of advancements in DNA testing. Kent Nagersmith did not give up. He said that Susan had died fighting for her life and that he too would die fighting for her justice. Kent never gave up that fight. Sadly, he died in 2016 before getting closure on the case. Improvements in DNA testing reignited a spark in the cold case in 2018. It was in 2022, however, that some light was shed on the investigation. Cape May County Prosecutor Jeffrey Sutherland said the results were a combination of dedicated effort and advanced analysis of genetic genealogy. Renowned genealogist C.C. Moore was able to identify 62-year-old Jerry Rosado as a match the DNA found on Susan. Rosado, a resident of Millville, was charged with second-degree sexual assault. DNA found under Nager Smith's fingernail and from a vaginal swab matched Rosado. The investigation placed Rosado in Wildwood around the time of her murder. Although confined to a wheelchair during his trial, Judge Bernard DeLury ruled that he would remain in jail until his trial. Rosado had, up until this point, been living in an assisted living facility in Cumberland County. His ailing health did not deter the judge from making the ruling. DeLury cited Rosado's conduct as proof that he presented a danger to the public, even if the danger was somewhat lessened by his poor health. He could face up to 10 years in prison if convicted. The case remains ongoing as Rosado has not been charged with Susan's murder. Margaret Johns remembers her sister, Teresa Caroline Filligan, fondly. Johns described Teresa as a typical rebellious teenager, a kid who knew nothing and was easily taken advantage of by a predator. For 41 years, Teresa's family were left in the dark when she suddenly disappeared. She had been living with Johns at the time and going on various job interviews. One day, though, she did not come back and she was never heard from again. In 1981, remains were discovered in the backyard of convicted serial killer Billy Mansfield Jr.'s family home. One of the bodies identified was that of Teresa Fillingham. Teresa was first reported missing by her sister, Margaret Johns, in 1980. Teresa was just 17 years old. After years of waiting, the family finally received the answers they had been looking for. John said that it has given them a sense of closure, knowing she was taken rather than just leaving. He said this is the first cold case that he's ever had that's gone this far to, you know, com completely being able to deliver the remains to the family. Teresa fell prey to the evil of Billy Mansfield Jr., a felon of the worst kind. Mansfield Jr.'s crimes were beyond comprehension, included in his criminal record as battery, kidnapping, and sexual assault. To him, the lives of others were merely for his personal entertainment. He showed no remorse for his actions. Billy Mansfield Jr. was convicted of murdering Renee Sailing in 1982 and given 25 years to life. He later confessed to the murder of four more victims found in Florida. He was then given four further life sentences. Mansfield Jr., along with his brother Gary and father William Sr., sexually assaulted each victim. Mansfield Jr., however, murdered and dismembered them. He later claimed to have buried them so he could keep them close. At the time of the trial, Teresa was not named as a victim. She was identified as one of the many Jane Doe's found in the backyard. However, as of July 2022, her remains had been identified. The University of North Texas and Parabon Nano Labs used DNA to identify each of the buried victims. Though the initial testing yielded no results, Parabon Snapshot technology was able to give them identifying features. This latest method used by Parabon was able to give Teresa's family the closure they needed. Johns wants the story of her sister to bring much-needed hope to those who still have loved ones that are missing. 
She also plans on keeping Mansfield Jr. locked behind bars, even if it means flying out to testify at his upcoming parole hearing. So now it gives me peace because I know I didn't lose her, that she was taken. For C.C. Moore, passion and determination in uncovering the truth has led to the solving of these five cases. By using self-taught methods in researching family history, Moore has opened a new field of discovery and DNA testing. Do you think Moore's methods can lead to the discovery of more unsolved cases? Let us know your thoughts on genetic genealogy testing in the comments below. Until then, stay safe.